What's on your mind? Oh, Joe. <laughs> Sure. So the funding source is um, the Medicaid uh, global spending cap, and, and it's Medicaid savings generated from other Medicaid initiatives. Um, and so that's the source. Um, and so every year um, we estimate, you know, well, Medicaid is under a global cap, and, um, and so we, we, we don't have new money, so we have to think smarter with um, the resources um, that we have how do we um, generate savings in certain areas? How do um, we Im improve efficiencies so we can make um, needed investments such as supportive housing? And so that, that has been um, the funding source um, since its creation. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we have had the opportunity to increase that investment um, every year. Um, and, and the goal is um, to see this program um, to see it last, and that's why the evaluation and the research component is, mm -hmm. is key, um, because we really want to demonstrate that this is a very cost-effective program, that it improves um, individuals' lives, um, that it, and, and in the same, uh, at the same time, it, it saves the state money. And so it should be a no-brainer to use Medicaid money, money to fund supportive housing instead of building another nursing home, right? Um, how can we keep people out of emergency rooms? Um, and, and one of the answers, and I really like, you know, Tony's, um, his cases, and I said next year, you know, um, we'd like to bring some uh, MRT individuals who, who reside in, in the apartments to kind of just explain to you all how this program improves their lives. Because I, you know, always sound like a bureaucrat, and, uh, but it, it's really um, a life-changing program, and we want to see it last for as long as possible, and we think it makes sense and saves money. And, and so, you know, we're trying to prove that with data. Um, and, and, you know, um, engage the federal, federal government um, that it saves money because, you know, I think folks have a very traditional thought of how you spend Medicaid money. It only goes for hospitals or emergency rooms, and we're really trying to, to broaden that thinking moving forward. I mean, I think you even got some of the hospitals thinking that way. Yeah, which is amazing through some of these performing right. provider, not to get into disrupt here, but, you know. <laughs> Uh, there's some incredible dialogue going on, and the f just what you said, the fact that we're using Medicaid sa money from saving from Medicaid to build housing, I don't know about you, but that's like a wow, right? I, to me, it's a wow, you know, so. There may or may not be an option for them. It's mm -hmm. something they may or may not mm -hmm. want to do. We are focusing on their health care needs. If they if they have chronic needs, mm -hmm. that's our first, you know, problem. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where we stay in terms of care coordinating. But, you know, that's an issue, especially for those clients that get referred to us. What there is seem to be a, a level of steps. I mean, I work in housing, I know I can go try to get a, a HRA 2010E, get all of that. Try it if they're eligible for New York, New York, fine. We look at CU Select Vacancy Report if they're eligible, if they can get into to the OMH housing, if there isn't yeah. the back draft from the site, you know, block site. There's all of these little tangible things. Mm -hmm. and, and so our steps when we're working with a client in housing is one way out in working with a health home client that's sleeping on a neighbor's mm -hmm. couch or a relative's couch mm -hmm. is, is different. There doesn't seem to be a clear enough process mm -hmm. that allows us to move forward in confidence, mm -hmm. in confidence, because, and so we feel a little out there. But I, I really also want to say, you know, I'm really happy um, that the agencies 
all working together, it really seemed like a breath of fresh air that there seems to be some unraveling of the convolution that often occurs, mm -hmm. you know, working with agencies. And so for that, I'm grateful. But I don't know if I missed a step here or what. There was 700 uh, units of housing where? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. where? I mean, who knew? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, the, the irony is that that was uh, part of the good, the bad, and the ugly that we learned is that we didn't know what the other place, what the other part of the system had. Um, and we didn't understand what the other part of the system had. So um, all these housing agencies, not just mental health, but Oasis, OPW, well not OPW, uh, in the city for actual supported housing uh, with health homes. The o Oasis, specifically Oasis and OMH, I'll say, worked with the health homes. And that was a requirement in uh, the rollout of their MRT. But the housing folks didn't know quite how to work with the health homes. The health homes didn't know quite how to work with the housing folks and didn't even know that there was um, eligible units. And I, I look at the, your agency where you work, your agency had units. So even in within agencies where there's, where there's health homes and residential programs, uh, that was the learning curve. And um, we've learned a lot about communicating and explaining what the availabilities are, not just for MRT housing, but across the board for housing availability and individuals who should be in health homes or are in health homes. Um, and I think, f at least for speaking for the Office of Mental Health, this is you know, the first step in how we're going to be moving forward with um, non uh, MRT funded units. Uh, we're, we've just rolled out statewide um, another 628 units that are targeted to folks who are in Article 28 and um, in psychiatric centers. And uh, those of you here in the city know that that RFP uh, came out this past, on May 30th. Um, we're going to do the same educational process because it's the same issue. Whether it's funded by MRT or if it's funded by community investment, it's the same issue. There's beds available for individuals in need. There's health homes who have people on their caseloads who need the beds. And how do you marry them? Well, so these, these 700 units or whatever amount of units that I might have, the way we're saying that we find out how we we are able to uh, make them available is that you'll divide them into agencies like you say, okay, so I'm going to take 50 units, go ahead and fill those in. Here, uh, Oasis, here's another 25 or 75 units. Because it's the, the lack of the communication that well, they have among each other. Well, it, it, that's that's what we learned in, the, in lessons learned. Um, what we did, um, we had 700 units statewide. Uh, different agencies were awarded those units. But all providers, all the health homes were at the table, the lead health homes, not the downstream providers. Uh, some downstream providers, but all the leads were uh, invited to and at just about all of the meetings that we had, at least here in the city, um, in most of the state as well. And um, were educated about where these availabilities are and how to uh, access them. Um, and then that's when we learned that, geez, this is a bigger problem than just OMH in knowledge, uh, lacking knowledge and um, education. So uh, C, I always get this wrong, CSH, not CHS, CSH, uh, as well as uh, our seven state agencies came together to say, okay, we have to we have to continue to educate people statewide about resources that are available, how to access them, or even what is available out there. Again, not just MRT, but as a system. Okay, but as a system, and what I'm hearing now, and you're saying that there's more units that are going to be rolling out, mm -hmm. are these just OMH? Well, I'm speaking about OMH right now. I'm speaking about okay, our, our RFP right now on the street, uh, yeah. but there are... Yeah, and, and maybe I can, um, and I, I apologize, I probably didn't um, clearly articulate, you know, um, one of the things that we are working on, which is another summer project, because um, we're going to be busy this summer, we're gonna be busy this summer and it's June, but um, 
you know, what what we did, and this is another lessons learned, is, you know, um, we funded $86, you know, million, dollars, and then we put these maps up of what was funded on our MRT website. It's a stagnant document. It's not updated. Um, and so moving forward, what we're trying to do is how do we improve it and centralize it and get the information out? And so how do folks know whether you're a health home, a housing provider, a discharge plan? Planner. How do you know what units are available, where they are, who to call, what the occupancy rate is, and and that's and that's what um, that's what we know is is um, is missing, and and that's what um, we appropriated um, half a million dollars to get that project up and running. Um, this year and so that's one of our main goals is to figure out how to centralize it and improve the process. I think too just to, just to piggyback on what Liz was saying there I think the first few years of any project is all about lessons learned and, and even from this conversation you know we take something away from that to say okay how do we now take what we just learned and better a system so I think we're all part and party to the mm -hmm. fact that we're going to better the system together by having even these exchanges and our summer projects mm -hmm. which will be very busy wow. so any other qu uh, more questions back there this isn't a question but I just want to say that I'm glad to hear that people are thinking about you know the sort of individual sort of boutique disability and how we can you know if somebody needs a unit and there's a, a unit available but also we need to think about the level of need that people have because often they're also slotted into something that's really not conducive to either their need or who they are or and that's something that I think is very important and the, the, this new thing of people who are living with HIV and AIDS only having you know, the ones who have SSI or income having to pay only 30, finally 30% of their income is an example of that because there were a lot of those folks in supportive right. housing because that was the only way that they could get them to pay 30% of their mm -hmm. income. So hopefully that uh, a lot of those units will open up. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of things going on here. One is the sort of innovation around housing itself, how it gets developed. And it's also, if you hear the service side of things, though we're talking about MRT housing, there's, same, there's a synergistic track around how do you create more person-centered wraparound. So one of the pilots you heard about from OMH came out of the MRT as to let's check this out. Now, it's, it's hard to execute things, right? So. You know, the execution is, you're hearing, you're going to hear about all the waiver money and systems transformation, and included in that is housing. So there's been discussions about housing and what does that look like. So what you heard, you know, we're talking about, well, you had X number of units, right, uh, at a time, point in time. I think there's, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you want to talk about this, some way of thinking more broadly or in real time, how do you create it on the spot? so to speak, based on the person who's in front of you as a plan of care who maybe is stuck in a hospital because there's no disposition, housing disposition, and what do we do? Um, I believe, and, and, and I've heard Liz and Moira talk, and Tony, we've been in some of these conversations where that's the thinking. Now, we've, I don't think you're there yet, but maybe you want to address some of the sort of the, I think the more flexible, yes, we got it. To the, I'm happy to hear about the, the access issues and kind of thinking more broadly, but it, I think we're also seeing housing as a more of a real-time kind of creation as we see people long-term, or at least trying to do some of that. Yeah. I, mean, I, think, I think you just said it. Oh, okay. More than that. That's it. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Point, you know, yeah. I think it, it, you know, it, it, we're, in, we're in a process, and the process is going to take time. Uh, trial and error, that's why we have pilots. Well, what have we learned from it? Some of these things that we think are great today, might not be a good idea. We might find out that, well, that's great, but it's not sustainable. So how do we do it differently? You know, so it, it, we're learning also. Um, the system's changing. And uh, it's all good. Is the um, evaluation piece and the cost savings over time, is that being handled by DOH? And, and how is that funded? And who, how do we as providers and others 
be involved, or which is there anything we should be looking at? Um, so I would say um, it's a multi-agency effort with um, the, the central agency um, being the health department. So, so the way we set it up, um, because we know each agency knows their populations um, the best, and so the lead agency that implements the MRT program is the lead agency that collects the data. They then um, submit that data monthly um, to um, our Medicaid data warehouse. And then the health department um, is the central agency that pulls that data out on the other side. And we're working with Salient to create um, what, what essentially is called a bookmark. And it's essentially um, the Medicaid identification numbers and then the pre-post Medicaid spend. And, and we can get into um, you know, as much detail um, as possible. Um, we can see uh, utilization. You know, are we seeing decreases in the emergency room? Are we seeing decreases in hospital uh, utilization? Are we seeing increases in primary care? And are, uh, is that individual enrolled in a health home? And so there, there's a lot of, um, I think, very useful information that we're very much looking forward um, to sharing. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't share it today because it's, uh, it's pretty early in, in development. Um, and so we thought if we shared anything, it would probably be premature. Um, so hopefully this time next year or even before then, we'll have, we'll have some um, good, news, good news to share. Um, but, um, and then the second piece is, you know, there's a lot of data security issues and, and HIPAA um, constraints, but I know providers have said time and time again, we want to know how we're doing and we want to know how, how we're doing compared to other providers. And so I think that's a, another conversation is how do we share the data back to providers um, and how do certain providers who maybe are doing it better or different share their best practices with other providers. And I think that's, that's something that we're working on this year as well um, because I think um, some providers um, some, some are more sophisticated than others, and some they don't know how they're doing or they think they're okay, but you know, no one knows. And, and so um, that, that's the next step in the coming year as well.